Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. If you truly love one another... You're going to get out of the combat zone, and you're going to try to find some middle ground where you can accommodate as much of what your partner wants as you possibly can, and your partner's going to accommodate as much of what you want as they possibly can. And that means both of you are moving towards the middle, and you're going to narrow the gap of difference a whole lot more than you think you can. I'm Dr. Phil, and this is Relationship Reality Check number three. So if this is the first one you're listening to, logic tells you you've missed number one and two. In number one, I spoke a lot about how you relate to yourself, because you are with yourself 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it stands to reason that if you don't get along with you, and you take yourself with you everywhere you go, That bad relationship is going to contaminate every interaction you have. Then in number two, I started talking an awful lot about the way you enter relationships with other people, the attitude of approach you bring to it, how much you really know about your partner. I said, while this deals with relationships with everyone, I'm going to talk about it as though it were your significant other. And I left you with a great tease after talking about five of the biggest myths about relationships that lead people down the primrose path. I said I was going to talk about the importance of four minutes out of every day. And I was talking to you about myths and the fact that I like busting myths. And the reason I said I like to talk about that so much is because It's not what happens in your life that gets you all upset, if you do get upset. It's not what happens in the world. It's whether or not what you expected to happen happened in your life. You see, you have expectations, something in your mind about how things are supposed to be. If once you get into the situation, that's not what happens, that really bothers you. That's what upsets you. You know, I've been a pilot since I was a teenager. I had a really great flight instructor. His name was Bill Solomon. He was in a little town in Texas. This was just an old cowboy. He wore cowboy boots and cowboy shirts, you know, the kind that snap up the middle. They don't have buttons. They have snaps and all kinds of ornate stuff all over the front of them. Wears a cowboy hat. And he was just a flight instructor. He was a cowboy, lived on a ranch, had horses, cattle and all, but he was a flight instructor. He was really a good student of human behavior. And I was very young and really very stupid, I'm sure. Lots of macho. I think he could tell that I had testosterone running in my veins instead of blood. And he sized me up pretty quick and said, you know, I always teach my students based on how they're going to use an airplane. And I can tell already, at a very young age, you're a hard driver. And that tells me that you're going to fly whenever you want to fly instead of when you should fly. For that reason, I suspect, unlike a lot of other people, you're going to fly whether it's clear and smooth or whether it's cloudy and raining and bumpy. So I'm going to teach you to fly in all kinds of conditions because I'm predicting that's what you're going to do. And he did. This was in the summer, and there would be days in Texas where the winds were blowing 20, 35 miles an hour. And I'd call and say, "Um, I assume we're not having our lesson. He'd say, no, we're having our lesson, because I know if you get ready to go somewhere 10 years from now, and it's all blustery and hot and blowing, you're going to go out there and strap in. So get out here. You're going to learn how to do it right now. So I would go out there, and he would strap in, and we got in such weather that, you know, those little vents you turn up in the ceiling to get air? 
I actually cut my head two or three times. It was so rough, I was hitting my head against the ceiling on those air vents. I mean, the airplane would just drop 500 feet and then jerk back up and move to the right, move to the left. It was like riding the wild mouse at the amusement park. But that's how I learned to fly. So later, when I had my license and I was by myself and I got into rough air, I was like, yeah, this is rough air. This is what I expected. I've been in this a hundred times. This is what I learned to fly in. My pulse didn't go up one bit. But he also trained my older sister, Dina. She was a sweaty palm pilot. She flew when it was severe clear and mill pond calm. I mean, it had to be like glass. And that's the only time she wanted to fly. In fact, I'm not sure she ever left the pattern. She would go up, make a left turn, go downwind, make a left turn on crosswind, left turn on final land. I think she just flew like a racetrack around the airport. That was the extent of her flight. And she absolutely loved it. And when she would fly by herself, she took a giant stuffed Snoopy dog and put it in the seat beside her because she didn't want to be by herself. The first time she ever got into any bumpy air, she completely panicked. Absolute crisis situation for her. I remember one time coming back from Oklahoma into Texas, we got on the fringe of some thunderstorms and it got pretty rough. I looked in the back seat where she was sitting and she was crying and turned white. I didn't even think anything about it. We got on the ground, and I said, what is wrong with you? She said, oh, my God, I can't believe we're still alive. And I have to say, she never flew again after that day. I'm dead serious. She never flew again after that day. Why? Her expectations were violated. Mine were not. I expected rough air. I learned to fly in rough air. I was used to being bumped around. It wasn't unsafe. It was just unpleasant. But for her, it was the same as going down in a screaming dive. It violated her expectation so much that she declared it a crisis, that she had cheated death, and would never do it again. We had a completely different expectancy set. How many times in your life have you gone into a situation where you expected one thing and got another and were really, really upset? Think back on it now and ask yourself, was it really that bad? Was it really that difficult? Was it really that overwhelming that you had to get out of the situation, you had to eject? Or was it just that you expected it to be different? The fact that your expectations were violated, you panicked. So many people go into relationships expecting that it's going to be a success-only journey, expecting that it's always going to be love-filled, expecting that it's going to be like when you were dating, expecting that you're going to be in the infatuation, falling in love phase all of your life. And when you transition out of it, you think the spark is gone, the fire has gone out, something is wrong, we've lost it, so I must have picked the wrong person. When in fact... You've just made a normal transition from the honeymoon phase to the stability phase. You just labeled it wrong. So that's why I like to clear up myths. You might actually have a very healthy relationship, but because you have unrealistic expectations, you label it as being unacceptable when in fact it may be well above the norm. The first myth I talked about was a great relationship depends on a great meeting of the minds, meaning you have to see things the way your partner does. That's not true. Myth number two, that it demands a great romance. That's just simply not true. I said myth number three was a great relationship requires great problem solving, that you've got to spot your problems, be able to work them out, get them behind you, and never see them come up again. That's just simply not true. There are some problems that you will never solve because you will never be like your partner. Myth number four, great relationship requires common interests that bond people together. Just simply not true. There are going to be things that you like to do that your spouse doesn't like to do and your spouse likes to do that you don't like to do. You don't have to have common interests. 
Opposites do, in fact, attract. Opposites do, in fact, complement each other. You know, ladies, you might be married to some jock who loves football, and loves getting outside and sweating and doing all this, and you may not be that way at all. Or you may be that way and he may not be that way. That's okay. You can be different. You have other things that you bond over, like children and togetherness and dreams and building a home and a life and a family. And myth number five that I didn't spend much time on because it's so ludicrous is that relationships, in order to be great, have to be peaceful. Merging two lives is not a success-only pain-free journey. We've all seen the headlines in the news of how someone lost their life in an act of cold-blooded murder. And while it sad and grabs your attention, most people go on with their day without giving it another thought. But have you ever stopped to think about the life of the person at the center of the news story? They were more than just a headline or a statistic. They were someone's loved one or friend. I'm Mike Morford, and my podcast, The Murder of My Family, dives into some of those stories to help listeners get to know the person who was lost and how their death affected those closest to them. Listen to The Murder of My Family everywhere you listen to podcasts. There are well over 100 episodes to binge on now. There are over 90,000 people missing at any time, and over half a million are reported missing every year. And that's just in the United States. I'm Mike Morford. And I'm Jess Betancourt. And in our podcast, Missing Persons, we discuss cases of people who have gone missing under mysterious circumstances. And we're joined in each episode by guests who are either related to the missing person, investigating their disappearance, or advocating for answers in the case. Missing Persons is available everywhere you listen to podcasts, and there are dozens of episodes to binge on right now. Subscribe today so you don't miss an episode. Now, I promised you at the end of last time that I was going to go through five more of what I call the Big Ten myths, but I also promised you something else. I promised you that I was going to talk to you about four minutes that can absolutely change your relationship. And let me tell you what those four minutes are. Those four minutes, and there's a lot of research to support this, by the way, those four minutes are what I call the first four minutes. Because research tells us that when significant others, when partners have been apart, maybe you get up, and you both go off to your jobs in the morning. Or maybe one of you stays home and the other one goes off. Or you just separate in the beginning of the day. You go your different ways, and you're apart for the day. And finally, at some point, you connect again. You come back together at the end of the day. What happens in that first four minutes dictates the tone and the outcome for the rest of the time you spend together. Let's say you've both gone off to work and you get home about 5.30 or 6 in the evening and you come in the door and one of you is standing there with a handful of bills that you picked up in the mailbox after you pulled the car in. And you walk in and you put them down on the kitchen table and the first thing you say to your partner is, Can you believe all of these bills? Look at this credit card bill. It's as thick as the phone book. What is the deal here? You have immediately set this up as a crisis situation. You've immediately elicited defensiveness from your partner. Or maybe you got a call at work about Billy at school, and Billy at school has been really disruptive, gotten in trouble, academics are slipping. They've called to tell you how poorly Billy is doing, and you're upset about it. So you walk in, and your husband's standing there, and you say, well, Billy's done it now. I got a call from the school, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, you've immediately defined this as a problem-oriented interaction. That is going to set the tone for the entire rest of the evening, the first four minutes. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a decision that no matter what has happened, I don't care if you came out of work and your car was totaled because a back-end loader dumped a telephone pole on top of it and your car is destroyed, those first four minutes should be about each other. Those first four minutes should be devoted to something positive. Those first four minutes should be acknowledging each other as human beings, focusing on the good things 
in your life, focusing on maybe remembering why you chose this person as your partner in life. Maybe it's talking about something funny that happened. Maybe it's talking about something exciting that you have been planning a vacation together and you got some information today you want to share. Maybe it's a really fun story about a couple that's a friend of yours, something that the two of you can have a good laugh about. Maybe you got some pictures with the dog or the cat or so. I don't care. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the first four minutes are spent with the two of you personally regarding each other in a positive way. You don't walk in the door being negative. You don't walk in the door solving a problem. You don't walk in the door addressing some crisis, some issue, picking up an argument from when you left that morning to go to work. You come in and you just call timeout, detente, truce. You walk over, give your partner a hug, say, hey, it's good to see you. Wasn't it beautiful out today? I feel good every time I turn in that driveway. I just love our house. I was thinking about our kids today. Aren't we blessed to have our kids? Whatever, you find something positive to share or interact. Something that's happened in your life, something that's happened in their life, something positive. And if you come in and they hit you with a problem, it's like, oh, you're not going to believe what the school called about today. Well, I'm sure it wasn't fun, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Come over and sit down with me for a minute. Otherwise, how was your day today? Tell me something good. You don't have to be coy about it. Just say, tell me something good. Tell me something good that happened in your day today. Well, let me tell you something good that happened in my day today. You know, when you do that, that too sets the tone. It's amazing how momentum takes hold and you get that sense of camaraderie, that sense of unity, that sense of togetherness. Research has shown that if you will take those first four minutes and refuse to problem solve, refuse to deal with crises, refuse to give criticism, refuse to take the bait, and focus instead on 100% positive, something that's funny, something that's a joke, something that's peaceful, something that's meditative, something that's counting your blessings, anything that's positive. And it doesn't have to be some big formula where you get around together and you hum or you have some meditation exercise. You just come in and you just interact positively. That can change the destiny of where that relationship is going to end up by 11 o'clock that night. You do that two days in a row, three days in a row, 30 days in a row, 45 days in a row then all of a sudden you have a completely different attitude, a completely different approach. So I know that seems like not a big deal, but I promise you, give me 30 days, four minutes a day. Think about it. Just four minutes a day. And if you get attacked in those first four minutes, don't take the bait. Turn the worm. Make it positive. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but. Tell me something good. Something happened to me today that was really fun. I want to tell you about it. And at the end of that, you need to deal with a problem. I promise you'll go at it with a completely different attitude. The first four minutes, that's a small thing you can do that has, in the aggregate, a significantly positive effect. And you're going to find, as we move forward, that small changes day to day Small changes in attitude, small changes in the way you speak, small changes in the way you act, add up across the days and the weeks and the months to completely overhaul a relationship. You don't have to leap tall buildings in a single bound. You can take the stairs. You just need to take a step up, take another step up, take another step up. And you don't even have to change your partner. You just need to change what you're doing just what you're doing. And the reason that right in the big middle of myths, I wanted to tell you about the first four minutes is because myth number six is a great relationship lets you vent all of your feelings. And that is just 
not true. You see, there's this myth that if you're in a relationship and you're being authentic and you love each other and you care about each other, that you ought to be able to say anything you want to say. I mean, you're being truthful, right? Wrong. You still have to be civilized. Just because you have the license to vent doesn't mean that you should. Because if you think your partner is going to forget mean and hurtful things that you have said or done, they might forgive it, but they will never forget it. So this whole attitude about, hey, I can say anything I want. It's okay. It's authentic. It's real. I can vent. There's a huge difference between being genuine and being brutally honest. And you remember, we've talked about this. Being genuine conveys your real sentiment. Being brutally honest means you're doing it in an uncaring and unempathetic way. You're doing it in a savage way. You're doing it in a way that takes into account your need to vent, but not the impact it's going to have on the other person. I want to give you a really good example of this that's very real life. I told you that I was in private practice for a long time, and I did my share of marriage counseling. I just wasn't very good at it. It wasn't that I didn't know what to say or I didn't know what to do. It just was that I didn't have the patience for saying and doing it. I just thought people ought to learn and change a little faster than they were prepared to learn and change. But I was dealing with a couple, and I'm going to change the names to protect the guilty. I'm going to call them George and Karen. There's a concept here that I want you to learn. It's called outrageous overshadowing. Outrageous overshadowing. Think about those words for a minute. Outrageous overshadowing. What could that possibly mean? I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this we're podcast. But we're not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> Hi, this is Rachel Yucatel, and I'm here to invite you to listen to my podcast, Misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. This podcast delves into the lives of those who have been reduced to a single headline. Each episode will take a closer look at the stories of those who are on a mission to change their narrative. Join me as we uncover the truth behind the misconceptions, shed light on the stories of those who have perhaps been wrongfully portrayed, explore the complexities of the human experience, and celebrate the power of second chances. Who doesn't love a good comeback story? Well, outrageous overshadowing is when you do something that is so over the top, so outrageous, that it gets so much attention that it overshadows anything they may have done. Now, I was working with a couple, George and Karen, and Karen was, let's just say she was a little paranoid about his being flirtatious. And I say a little paranoid because she saw a problem with everything he did. That was not realistic. But there were problems with some of the things he did. I mean, he did flirt some of the time. He did like attention from women, and he did kind of bask in that some. But they would go to church, and she would be jealous of Sister Margaret, honestly. I mean, it didn't matter what he did. He could be at a stoplight, and a good-looking girl could pull up in the car next to him, and she would think it was planned in some way. And again, not to say that he was a saint. But she was so hypersensitive to it that she really lost all credibility. It was kind of like the little boy that cried wolf. Every time something came up, she made a huge deal out of it. And she might have been right one out of 20 times to a degree. I don't think he ever actually had an affair with anyone. But people have asked me many times, Dr. Phil, how do you define flirting? When does it cross the line? There's a real easy definition for me. If you wouldn't do it with your partner standing there, then it's crossing the line. If you're chatting up some guy or 
some guy's chatting up some cute girl at work. If you wouldn't do exactly the same thing with your wife or husband standing there, then that's probably crossing the line. That's just a real good way to judge that, in my opinion. But if you are so hypersensitive about it that it really has become a controlling, consuming jealousy, then you're hurting yourself and your partner. But she had made the decision one time that he had really been inappropriate at an office function. And, you know, on a scale of one to 10, if five was okay, he might have been a six or a seven. He might have paid a little attention to a particular young woman that was kind of his fantasy. Didn't touch her, didn't go off with her, but certainly was offensive to her sensibilities. I think anybody that looked at the situation would have agreed. They had a blow up over this, and she kicked him out. While he was gone, she took green fluorescent spray paint and painted everything he owned with green fluorescent spray paint. Now, they call jealousy the green-eyed monster. I don't think it was an accident that it was green fluorescent paint, but she painted all of his clothes, suits, shirts, pants, everything. Then she took a butcher knife and she stabbed the heart of every shirt he owned. And then she cut out the crotch of every pair of pants that he owned. Now, he was a real stereo buff and he had the most fabulous sound system you've ever seen in your life. So she took every bit of his stereo system, all of his electronics, took it into the master bath, put it into the bathtub pulled the stopper shut, turned on the water with all the equipment in there, dumped an entire box of laundry detergent on top of it, and completely soaked it. Then she wrote things on the wall in his study where he had a home office that I can't repeat. So she's now cut all of his clothes up, painted everything green, taken all of his stereo system, soaked it in the tub, and by the way, left the water running, left the house, went and checked into a hotel. Now, that's what I call outrageous overshadowing. At this point, does it really matter whether he was talking to somebody too much at the office party or not? No. He's going to get a pass on that because what she did was so outrageous, so over the top, looks so insane that Everybody looks at her, and he gets a pass. If he had had this girl on his desk having sex with her, and she goes home and does all of this, all eyes are going to be on her, and everybody's going to say, oh, that poor man. Did she have a right to be offended? Did she have a right to vent her feelings? Probably so, but she went so far, and her attitude was, hey, that's how I felt. That authentically, realistically, is how I felt. And I've always been told, if you can't be honest with your partner, what's the point? Well, whoever told her that, whoever gave her the idea that that gives you a license to violate your partner's space, to violate their property, to degrade them, to do all of these things to them, certainly gave her a bad message. The point's really clear. Before you say something, it could be disastrous. Before you do something that could be disastrous. Before you say or do something that is not ever going to be forgotten. Before you do something that is just going to be really hard to unring that bell, you need to really think about that. Because there are an awful lot of things that seem like a good idea at the time. You know, the old adage, count to 10 before you say something. That's so you can cool off a little bit. When he came home and found all of that, I still know these people. And I don't think he's over that yet. Because he knows what she's capable of. He knows how much she is willing to hurt him, how much she is willing to strike out at him. And it really doesn't matter what he did. Nobody talks about that. What they talk about is this insane woman 
that cut the heart and crotch out of his clothes, then painted them green before she destroyed all the things that he valued. And most people would say, man, if he wasn't cheating, he should. People start justifying unjustifiable behavior. The fact of the matter is, he may have been inappropriate, and that should be dealt with. But because of this venting, because of this talking before you think, he just gets a free pass. What is myth number seven? Myth number seven is that a great relationship has nothing to do with sex. Yeah, well, that's not right. It does have something to do with sex. I'm not saying that sex is everything. If you have a good sexual relationship, it registers about 10% on the important scale, meaning it makes up about 10% of what's important in the relationship. But if you do not have a good sexual relationship, it registers about 90% on the important scale. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is if you have a good sexual relationship, You enjoy it, you feel relaxed and accepted and involved and intimate with your partner, and you just move on to all the other aspects of the relationship, all the other parts of intimacy, the sharing, the mutual support, the knowing each other, the being able to read each other, the things that really define the relationship. So if you've got it, it's about 10% and you move on to other things. But if you don't, it's about 90%. Why? Because man's number one need is acceptance. And when I say man, I mean humans. I don't mean man, male, man. I mean people, male or female. Our number one need is acceptance. Our number one fear is rejection. And when you're in a romantic relationship, when you're in a committed relationship, the most vulnerable you feel is if your partner is attracted to you or not. If you are rejected at that level, if your partner shuns you sexually, they say, I'm just not attracted to you. I'm just not stimulated by you. I just have no desire for you. That's when it becomes 90% because you can't get past it. If that is good, if that is meeting both partners' needs, that's when it's about 10%. You say, okay, check that box and let's move on. How well do we know each other? How much time do we spend with each other? What kind of problems do we need to resolve? What's our communication levels? How do we respond to each other sensitively, et cetera? So ask yourself, what does it communicate if you have an asexual relationship? And I'm not just talking about intercourse. I'm not just talking about the act itself. When you ask people, you know, how often do you have sex? Give a survey, you ask people. They're going to lie. If they say four times a week, it's two. If they say two, it's one. For some reason, everybody feels the need to exaggerate that. But here's what I believe, and here's what I've observed. There's a difference between men and women when it comes to the sex act. And I can tell you that there's a real disconnect here. The time from the initiation of the sex acts to satisfaction for men is about somewhere between four and six minutes. For women, it's about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that there's a disconnect there. Somebody's getting their needs met and somebody's not, unless there's real good communication going on. So somebody will say, how long does it take to have sex? They say, well, he says four to six minutes. She says 15 or 20. Here's what I say. I say it takes about two days, and I'll tell you why I say that. In the real world, in real relationships, having sex on a Wednesday night may start Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning because you're going through your week, you're busy buzzing around. Let's say Tuesday morning, you're both getting ready to leave, and you just take a little extra time, you know, that kiss goodbye is just a little bit longer. That hug is just a little more personal and a little less hurried. When you get home that night and you're having dinner, maybe there's a little more physical contact in the kitchen. You know, maybe there's a little more 
eye contact, a little more interplay. Then the next morning, again, there's now actually a little flirtatiousness going on. There's maybe a call during the day. Then it comes time for dinner that night. Maybe there's a little more interaction then. There's a little effort to maybe put the kids to bed with a little less chaos. It just starts ramping up where the priority list is shuffled. What was at the top of the priority list, which was kids, job, laundry, car, bill paying, da 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 all of a sudden, your relationship starts drifting to the top. You start regarding each other a little bit more. You start paying attention to each other a little bit more. So Wednesday night, when you go to bed, you do have relations. I think in most situations, if you will look, that act actually started 18, 24, 36 hours sooner. Call it foreplay, call it dialing in sensitivity or whatever. The reason a good sexual relationship is so important is not that time that you're together in bed. It's all the time that's leading up to it. It's all the attention that you share with one another. It's everything that goes on between you leading up to it, and then the closeness that you have afterwards. That's why it's so important. Not just that four to 20 minutes. It's everything before that and after that. That's important because without it, you also start to lose emotion. You start to lose emotional expression. It can be of enormous symbolic importance. It can be the greatest single point of disappointment in a relationship. It can lead to feelings of deep anxiety and rejection and inadequacy, or it can be a great sense of security and appreciation. It causes you to focus on the other person. It causes you to pay attention to what their needs are. So is it important? Yes, it is. It's very important. Number eight, a great relationship cannot survive a flawed partner. Well, boy, oh boy, we better all hope that's not true, because if that's true, we need to all get a bus to come through our neighborhood and pick us up and take us down to the courthouse together, because we're all flawed partners. We're all flawed partners. Come on. It's all a matter of degree, right? Most therapists will wrongly tell you that if you have what lay people would call, quote, craziness, or even serious weirdness in the character makeup of one or both partners, that a good relationship, a healthy relationship, is just impossible. But of course, people that say that are selling therapy. They're saying, hey, you got to come in and get this fixed. No, you don't. No, you don't. I can't tell you how many marriages have come to a quick end because one of the parties would say that the person I married turned out to be really some kind of, quote, nutcase, or they turned out to have these quirky, idiosyncratic behaviors. I'm not sure we even really have a good handle on what normal is, but I'll guarantee you, you go down the neighborhood and you stop at one door and then another and then another and then another, Whatever normal is at your house is not what they call normal at the house next door or the house next door to them or the house next door to them. It's different in every house. It's all in how you label this. I have dealt with families that have had full-blown psychotics in the home that were actually good parents, but they had certain characteristics about them that made them atypical. They were different. You know, relationships can be very adaptive, and you can really bend yourself around individual differences. I had a family in therapy at one point where, frankly, the mother was schizophrenic. She was very high-functioning, I'll say that, but she was very devoted to her husband and children, and her hallucinations mostly auditory, were 
pretty benign. They were non-disruptive to the family and home. But it was definitely behavior that was worthy of change. There's no question about it. I mean, she was hearing voices. Her name was Carol Ann, and she herself wanted to be better. She had insight, which is a huge factor in the outcome of therapy. She and her husband, Don, came in. He was always with her. He came to all of the sessions. He was always with her. I made some progress with her across time. I mean, it was change-worthy behavior, even though they accommodated to it. It was change-worthy behavior. When I say I made some progress, I say some because in one of our later sessions, she had reportedly said she hadn't heard a voice for like 14 days in a row, which was the longest period of silence ever. And when I asked her if she was hearing any voices, she said she was not. I asked her if she completely and fully understood that these were hallucinations and not someone trying to possess and control her. She said, yes, I do understand that completely. I know this is all in my head. I totally get that. But she said, just to be on the safe side, I did cut all the wires in our intercom system throughout the entire house. We had speakers in every room, and I went through, because that's where I hear these voices coming from. I know they're not there. I know they're not in the walls. I know they're not in those speakers, and I haven't heard anything for 14 days. But just to be on the safe side, I cut every wire and every speaker in the house. Now, Does that mean that she's really cured? Does that mean she's really got this under control? Well, probably not. I mean, she was a beautiful, intelligent, energetic woman, fabulous mother with great insight. But everybody knew, her kids knew what was going on, her husband knew what was going on. And in this case, even she knew what was going on. I remember talking to her husband about it. I said, how do you cope with this? He said, well, We've just decided that it's charming. (laughs) We've just decided that she's exotic and it's charming. She's not defensive about it. So I can just ask her, are you listening to me or are you listening to somebody else? And she'll say, well, I'm listening to somebody else, if you don't mind. So they just adapted to it. And look, I'm not saying that that should be on the resume of who you're looking for, that you go out and look for somebody that's neurotic or psychotic, but I am saying nobody is going to be like everybody else. And you don't have to say because somebody is atypical or has a unique way of being in the world that that means you can't adapt to it. Maybe it's workaholic. Maybe it's claustrophobia. Or maybe they do have to have all of their peas in a line on their plate. As long as they're getting by, as long as they're functioning, and certainly if they're open to talking about it, you can accommodate this. That leads us right into myth number nine, which is there's a right way and a wrong way to make your relationship great. That is simply not true. Everybody is different. Everybody knows there's no right or wrong way to be in a relationship. Maybe you're in a relationship where the mom stays at home and the dad works. Maybe you're in a relationship where the mom works and you have a stay-at-home dad. It really doesn't matter. There's not one right way to raise children. There's not a right way to relate to your in-laws, to handle disputes, to deal with anything. You do what works for you. And you know couples who conform to no known model of relationships, yet they're happy. My grandparents on my mother's side are a perfect example. They defied every relationship rule or model I have ever even heard about. These were two simple, uneducated, hardworking people that spent 60-plus years married living together in a small West Texas town. We were like 5,000 people in this town, and my grandfather ran a freight warehouse. My grandmother took in ironing. She worked seven days a week. They were dirt poor, salt of the earth. And I had a great opportunity to watch these two people because I spent summers there as a teenager. They probably didn't speak to each other more than 25 words a week. They did not sleep in the same room. Their only common interest was survival. But even then, I noticed that they did relate. No matter where we were or what we were doing, they always seemed to arrange things in such a way that they were physically close to each other. And in most cases, they were actually touching each other in some way. 
they had this huge dinner table in this giant old house. And even if it was just the two of them eating a meal, they would both sit on one little corner of the table as though they were both eating off the same TV tray. Now, they may not say 25 words to each other, but it's amazing to watch the two of them. He was six foot nine and she was four foot 11. It was really comical to see them walking down the street. They're not somebody poets or songwriters would write about, but they were together for 60 years. And to come in and try to change them or get them to do things different would just completely be a waste of time. My attitude was, don't fix what ain't broke. You do what works for you. There's just not a right way or a wrong way to do it. Don't think because some book says you have to do it this way or some therapist says you have to do it this way. If it works for you, you're comfortable, you're happy, then do it. That ties into the last myth. Your relationship can become great only when you get your partner straightened out. You don't need me to say much to you about this. The only person you control is you. You don't need to fix your partner. You can't fix your partner. You're not going to fix your partner. The house you need to clean is your own. You can inspire your partner. You can encourage your partner. You can trigger your partner. And I'll promise you, by the end of us doing what we're going to be doing here, you will inspire your partner to behave and think and feel in different ways. But never think you can control them. You have enough trouble controlling yourself. What I want you to do is say, look, this is relationship reality check. And what I want to do is make sure that I'm being a good partner, that my heart is open, my mind is open, my arms are open. I'm doing everything I can. And if this relationship doesn't work, It won't be because I was rigid. It won't be because I was demanding and controlling and judgmental. It will be because of some reason other than me. Because as for me, I'm going to approach this with an open mind and an open heart, and I'm going to lean into it and ask myself as my life manager, what can I do? to make this relationship work? What can I do to inspire myself and my partner and everybody around me to be passionate about being together? To do that, you're going to have to do something called eliminating your bad spirit. Because we all have things that we do that get in our way. Some of us are scorekeepers. Some of us are fault finders. We just can't look at somebody without taking their inventory. Some of us are rigid. We think it's our way or the highway. We're passive warmongers. We just do all kinds of things that program us to fail. I'm going to get you to see that in yourself so you stop being self-defeating. And when you do, you're going to find that the principle of reciprocity does work. I'm going to get you to have the insight you need to recognize why the world relates to you the way it does. Because I have, since I was 12 years old, been fascinated with why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do. There's a second part to that, and that's how to get people to do what they do and not do what they don't do. There is a powerful powerful weapon in getting people to do what you want and need them to do. It's what I call the secret sauce. And I'm going to reveal that to you the next time we talk. I'm Dr. Phil.